Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Show with Bill Hall. The show about stuff most people try to avoid, but can't because it controls their lives, religion, culture, and politics. Why does Bill Hall host this show? Because he and Bonhoeffer hoisted a few brews together in Berlin. Ah, uh, nope, that never happened. Is it that Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, both challenged and changed Bill as a young man? Well, yes, that is part of it. But it's primarily because Bonhoeffer called us to a costly discipleship. And there has never been a time when such courage has been more absent or desperately needed than now. Bonhoeffer famously said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. The Bonhoeffer Project is committed to turning leaders into disciple makers. Because if leaders fail to create disciple making movements, then we have failed. So, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's still tall and good looking. And yes, he is wearing German cologne. He's acquired a few more underlying conditions. But direct from his underground bunker in Long Beach, California, the man who once told Don Henley, you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave, Bill Hall. Welcome back to the Bonhoeffer Show. Yes, we're still looking for Diedrich Bonhoeffer. We're hoping to find him very soon. Uh, we always say he is walking the streets of Los Angeles with leader holes in on. So if you happen to see a picture of him, let us know. All right. Uh, order and chaos. That's what we're going to talk about today. Let us not be afraid of the fact, Leslie Newbigin says, that the church is different from the world. That the reality that we celebrate, that we share, that we rejoice in our worship, is a reality that the world treats as an illusion. We have to understand, Newbigin says, what we're working with here. We, the churches that stand on street corners in the neighborhoods, small gatherings of Christians and homes, people who are presenting the gospel to other people. To many people, this is just an illusion. It's something that they don't fully grasp or understand. They think it's somehow uh, a period, maybe not a grand period in the evolutionary cycle of humans as we move through this period of needing some sort of solace for life to solve the death problem, but that will outgrow this. And just like the original enlightenment, this will continue and will evolve into greater and higher truths. And that as a result through science and rationality, that we will achieve something that even in our low state at this point, we never can or will. So uh, this is Newbigin. He's He's making us think about some of the bigger thoughts. Right now, in America, Christians, particularly conservative Christians, and I want to speak to that here in a moment because I would consider myself a conservative Christian, conservative theologically. Uh, uh, so I think that conservative Christians in America are living in a moral chaos. There is confusion and disorientation regarding our social surroundings. Uh, evangelicals are asking, what kind of country am I living in? It's changing so fast. Where are we headed? Has the moral order collapsed? Before the pandemic, conservative hopes were riding high. Great economy, strong military socialism. I'm sorry, strong, <laughs> there's no such thing. Strong military Socialism on the run, bright days ahead. Then came the pandemic, the protests, riots. And of course, there was the war on Donald Trump by big media and the war of Donald Trump against big media, big tech, big industry, big sports, and big everything. A scorned and angry left ganged up on him in the end and defeated him. 
Unprecedented division now exists in the nation. No one knows what is going to happen next. What seemed in great order has now become chaotic. America is not divided by religion and race. Particularly race is promoted as a major crisis. A crisis is something, if you don't do something now, we're all going to die. But it is a problem. Race is a problem. And uh, I don't want to go much further right now. Global climate change is not a crisis. It is a problem. Government spending is an actual crisis, meaning if we don't do something now, it won't matter what else we do. We will no longer be a powerful nation. Problems do exist, and they have long-term solutions. Race is a major victory for America. We are the least racial society on earth. That doesn't mean that there isn't racism. It just means it's illegal. We've repented of our sins. We have changed, and it shows in this country. We have made great strides in climate. And we are doing better than most nations. Solutions are, but solutions are long-term in nature. Our greatest divide in America is philosophical. It is worldview. It is about moral authority. And around that issue, there is chaos. Let me give you an example. Donald Trump was not known as a Christian before he ran for president. Some reported that indeed he had become one just before he became president. To many Christians, this seemed a bit convenient. Particularly progressive Christians saw it as a political move. One thing was clear to conservative Christians, Trump seemed to be in favor of a more conservative interpretation of the Bible. For example, he was anti-abortion. He supported a more traditional view of marriage. He was a law and order candidate or advocate. He also supported religious liberty, freedom of speech, and the Second Amendment. The capstone was he appointed originalist judges to the federal courts and three new conservative judges to the Supreme Court. Our new president, Joe Biden, is also a religious man. He could be said more spiritual, more consistent, and more faithful than Trump. While Trump is a bundle of chaos looking for a place to happen, Biden represents, at least in his demeanor, order, a sigh of relief for an emotionally exhausted nation, he and many of his fellow progressive Christians possess and read Bibles. Fewer liberal Christians do attend weekly services than conservatives. This is easily proven by Gallup polls, the Pew Research Center, Barna Group. They all say the same thing. The pandemic has distorted any meaningful comparison at the present time, but back to President Biden for a moment. He seems to have interpreted the Bible differently. His Bible reading somehow has commanded him to expand abortion rights, even though his church abhors it. His compassion has been saved up for immigrants, even criminals, and his executive orders have been so far left that they defy common sense. His decree that allows trans men to compete against women in athletics will ruin women's sports and set back the women's movement decades. He seems to be a reed blowing in the political winds. We should all prefer that he be guided by inner conviction. I pray that he will do so. We are wondering what is at his core. What seemed calm actually is a storm of radical actions that will exacerbate our differences and create even more chaos and more moral confusion. So this is the moral confusion that we're facing. Philosophically, President Biden is taking the nation in a more systemic liberation theology direction. Classic liberation theology joins liberal theology with liberal political theory, primarily social, socialism that reorders society. It is another utopian ideology that denies actual human nature and reality in general and always requires authoritarian government to install. Now, this is understandable in that the left has historically dismissed personal sin and focused more on systemic cultural sin. Uh, this goes back to Diedrich Bonhoeffer's first trip to New York in 1930. He attended Union Theological Seminary for one year. He didn't agree with their liberal deconstructive approach to the biblical text that led to the erosion of biblical authority. Bonhoeffer didn't get along with the line of the left, Reinhold Niebuhr. 
Niebuhr believed that societal sin that led to racism and poverty were greater sins and was a brilliant proponent for such a view. This, of course, flew in the face of orthodoxy and made him the darling of the secular left. He made fun of Billy Graham, and put, which put him on the cover of Time magazine. You might remember the magazine, the former magazine called Time. He joined Graham himself and C.S. Lewis as cover stories. The intellectual elite and ruling class despise fundamentalism and its corpone spirituality. It's clear that the ruling class remained arrogant and superior, both left and right, or according to their own words, many are calling for a deprogramming of people who disagree with them. Again, they have a secular worldview. Worldview is shaped by theology, religion, and philosophy, which, of course, combined with lived experience and don't underestimate the power of snobbery. You can forget your Latin and your Greek and the history of art you studied at your university or left-wing seminary, but being a snob stays with you for life. In a few minutes, we'll be back after a break to introduce our co-host for today, Dan Lights, lead pastor at Calvary Chapel in Oceanside, California, and Cindy Perkins, a leader extraordinaire, professor, uh, great cook, sports fan, and the executive director of the Bonhoeffer Project. So we'll be back in just a moment. We turn leaders into disciple makers. That's the mission of the Bonhoeffer Project. But before we can turn you into a disciple-making leader, we need you to be in a cohort. A cohort is a one-year, 10-meeting, book-reading, praying, wrestling, writing, planning challenge that has the potential to change you and thus redirect your life. Interested? Here's the process. Go to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, and complete the application form. We will contact you. We will then help you select the type of cohort that's best for you. In person, online, or online school, which is asynchronous, so it's not affected by time zones and anyone in the world can access it. Oh, and training is now also available in Spanish. In the meantime, subscribe to the show, read one of Bill's books, and send us a question you want Bill or some member of the Bonhoeffer team to answer. And now, back to the show. Well, this short history that I just put on the table is the real divide. It is between one interpretation of Scripture that proposes that the Bible is true and is, has moral authority in a person's life, and the view that the ancient book on which our society has been built needs to be reinterpreted and reapplied to American life. The progressive interpretation of the Bible dismisses several key doctrines of the historical Christian faith. One, Jesus Christ is God incarnate and the only way to heaven. That any sex outside of marriage is immoral and a sin. That hell is a real place where those who reject salvation will spend eternity. That ideal marriage is between one man and one woman that God created the world and universe and one day will set up his kingdom from which he will reign, that people are eternal, not the physical universe. All right, so I wanna stop there and, enter, and just bring in our, our guest panelist uh, and uh, co-host for today. Uh, and about these six points that seem to be under serious threat uh, by progressive Christianity, mostly, uh, by default through secular ideology and people who stand outside of the Christian tradition. But let's talk about this. Uh, Cindy Perkins, you have worked for 20 years as a pastoral position in a church in Florida. You have been teaching at Trinity University in Florida for a few years now. You are dealing with all kinds of people around the country and around the world through the Bonhoeffer Project as its executive director. Uh, do you feel like, uh, which six of these do you think is most under threat? Uh, just uh, 
go ahead and wax eloquent on these, this issue of uh, uh, what threats we have before us. Well, I think as I, as a general rule, what I look at the most um, is the number one on the list. Um, Jesus Christ is incarnate, is God incarnate, and the only way to heaven. Um, I haven't grown up in the me generation um, where our motto was, if it feels good, do it, right? That is transferred into uh, every area of our society now, most particularly in the places where people learn, which is the church and the university schools. Um, and, and so as we step into that place, when I talk to people that don't believe that Jesus is God incarnate, that don't believe in the truth of the word, that don't believe that Christ is the only way, because it realistically, if I can figure out a different way, then I get to be God in my own life right? If I make Jesus God, then I don't get to be God. So I've got to think about that. Do I want somebody else to be God in my own life? And so um, when we step into that place, the biggest piece for me is to help them understand um, that we don't get to make that choice. That choice was already made at creation. I go back to Psalm 139, um, we've got a major identity crisis in this nation. And as I've worked with people for 20 years, that's what I find even in the church uh, and even sometimes in the pastorate is people have an identity crisis and they feel like they need the approval of men rather than, than the approval of God in order to be successful, in order to be um, useful in, in any part of life. And so we have to start in that place of helping people understand that Jesus is God incarnate um, and, and there is but one way to be in fellowship with God for eternity. That assumes that we believe the other, that people are eternal, right? That the physical universe is not eternal. It is in decline. Our physical universe, uh, the laws of nature that God set into place are that uh, what's not moving forward is in decline, right? And so helping people understand that and understand that um, for me to be me, I have to understand that I was created by a holy God for a plan and a purpose. And in that plan and purpose, I have to now surrender who I am to him because he created me. I can't create myself, right? Like my, my dad would tell me, He's been gone a long time and he got, he met Jesus six months before he died. So his theology was all over the place and off, but he said, you can be anything you want to be. Well, no, I can't be anything I want to be. There's no way I can be a basketball player. I'm as uncoordinated as they come, right? It's not going to work. I have no hand-eye coordination. I can't do that. I can't be a big gamer. I can't, none of that, but I can be what God has called me to be. But to do that, I have to believe that he is God incarnate. And I think until we help our folks understand that, we, we don't, we're gonna have a hard time taking care of any of the other, right? Because sex outside of marriage, back to if it feels good, do it. Uh, hell's, hell's not a real place because a, a, a good God wouldn't make hell and condemn people to hell, right? Um, marriage can be whatever I feel like it needs to be. And it all to me rolls back to Jesus as God incarnate. And there's only one way. Dan, where, where does the, uh, if you were going to, uh, let's say, say what percentage of your congregation would hold to these six points in a more traditional way, where would you say your congregation is? Well, I would say, um, 65%, 75%. And again, that's, that's just based on, upon the fact that I know that there's a lot of people that come that aren't, uh, necessarily members, they're looky lose, they're window shopping. Um, so I don't know where everyone's at, but those who are committed, those who are, um, on board with the, uh, message and the mission of the church, uh, you know, it's a hundred percent. Um, so again, there's, you know, kind of a two, two pronged approach to that. I just want to say, I'm offended by all of these. Yeah. I'm offended by them. And the reason I'm offended by them is because they go against my flesh. 
but that is the culture we live in where everything is perpetually offensive. And if then offensive, wrong. It's got to be wrong. God wouldn't offend me. God would not, you know, but again, as, as Cindy said, that makes me God. Uh, my God is a creation of my own mind because he would never offend me. He would never make me feel bad. Uh, and this is even to what you were saying earlier, Bill, there's no moral principles anymore in the country. And so when you look at what uh, President Joe Biden said back in the 70s and the moral principles that he held then, they're different today. Has the morality of God changed? No, the culture has. And so the moral principles have waned and blown and changed with the wind. Uh, what is the prevailing culture? And so you see so much. Again, the way that I look at it as the, the, the darker the world gets, the lighter, the more bright the Christians get because we're holding the line. And all of these things that we hold as evident and true, when people come to church on a Sunday morning, they're not looking for more of the world. They're looking for something different than the world. And that's what we have to offer. The difference, the truth, the, the foundation, the, the, the solidity of a culture that's not blowing in the wind. Um, truth. And when you stand on that truth, Oh man, there's nothing like it, but this world, it's foreign to them. It's foreign, but we need to hold the line. Yeah. I, I, I hear people, you know, it's kind of a, it's very slippery kind of oily surface. This whole philosophical doctrinal issues within evangel the broader evangelicalism. And especially, you know, we now have sort of a cleavage between the evangelical left and the evangelical right. And I don't know, I think there's about as many people in the evangelical middle as there are uh, uh, moderate Republicans or Democrats these days. Uh, I think that the idea that Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ is God incarnate uh, and the only way to heaven, you hear uh, statements sort of like, there's only one way to God through Jesus, but there's many ways to Jesus. And what that is doing is it's providing a more open way to get to Jesus um, so that variety of religious expressions can uh, be considered available. So like a Hindu who practices what Jesus says, knows, maybe doesn't know Jesus by name, but he lives and practices Jesus' life, and therefore that's good enough. Uh, you know, sex outside of marriage. Well, yeah, that's, uh, it used to be that, that it was considered really important to maintain that. But when you start reading the Bible and saying, well, that was kind of old fashioned uh, in the first century and even before the first century, because women got married at ages 14 or 15. And so it's unreasonable to expect a woman 35 to maintain that kind of, that kind of life. Uh, that you, you start getting rationalizations uh, and different interpretations, uh, ways to reinterpret scripture. Uh, I see that as the more dangerous aspects of it all. Um, now, let's move on a minute. And uh, what we are talking about here is, uh, I use the illustration of Moses uh, going up on the mountain to hear from God and to be with God and his brother Aaron being left behind with the responsibility for the people. And things didn't go well. Uh, didn't take long for them to have Aaron tell everybody, bring your gold and we'll melt it down and we'll make a golden calf here and it's party time. And, <laughs> and, and the humor of it all is, is that God says, hey, Moses, come here. You, you got to get down there, man. Things are good, looking pretty bad. And uh, he gets down there, and Moses doesn't think it's going to be all that bad. But when he gets down there, he's so angry, he takes the Ten Commandments and, and throws them down and, and destroys them. So um, this tells us a little bit about human nature, doesn't it? And, and I was thinking maybe, uh, Dan, you, would you like to comment on that? Oh man, again, as you're, as you're tackling this idea, listen, 
in a sense, just I'm, I'm kind of tagging this from the first question. When, when there is not a solid, uh, gosh, intentional, focused preaching taking place in churches, then the the you know it, well, I, there's a line that's uh, I remember from a long time ago. When there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pews. That's right. Yeah. If there is no intentionality in our preaching, because I see it, listen, I, and again, I'm not lumping every church together, but I know of churches that preach Christianity light because of numbers, because of finance, because they want to continue to have a certain amount of influence or popularity. If that is the state of the church, I'm telling you right now, that isn't preparing anyone for what's to come. Um, and as we continue down that road, that's, again, that's why I say 100% of the people at my church know where we're at. There are still some who are, you know, toe in the water, maybe they're ankle deep at this point, and they may not ascribe to everything just yet, but you're not going to be comfortable long sitting in the pews because all these things are preached from scripture, backed up with scripture as God would have it. So when you don't have that and you leave things up to ambiguity and you leave things up to opinions and you don't preach authoritatively from God, I mean, you have left people in a bewilderment, in a wandering. You have not given them any sort of cure. You have not given them any sort of direction for their lives. And it, it, it is basically, um, it is a shame on pastors that don't authoritatively preach the word of God. Yeah, and staying on top of it. Well, we're going to have to take another break. Uh, and uh, so we're going to talk now from here from Steve Simmons about how you can get involved in the Bonhoeffer Project. And you must, if you're not, you're being naughty. So uh, be nice, join up, become part of it, join the revolution. If you want to expand the disciple-making movement, then share the show with your friends and colleagues. Hey, it's easy to subscribe. Simply go to iTunes or to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, then click on The Bonhoeffer Show. Once you do, we will keep you updated with The Bonhoeffer Project's events, new materials and books, as well as the larger disciple-making movement current news. You can also access previous programs. And be sure to read Bill's weekly column, which is posted on the website. Remember, ask questions. Bill's answers are guaranteed to give you herd immunity, increase your IQ, and cause you to experience waves of euphoria. Well, not really, but his answers are really good. And now, let's get back to the Bonhoeffer Show. Well, thank you again, Steve Simmons. And if you, uh, you can go to the bonhoefferproject.com, uh, go to the part which says uh, apply for cohorts and uh, you'll see what's available and uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if we hear from you, you'll hear from us. All right, uh, I wanna close the program today with just some, uh, uh, some suggestions that we have with respect to the Word of God and, and uh, or what to do is, number one, read, study, memorize, meditate on the Scriptures. It will provide stability, focus, and comfort that God is knowledgeable and in ultimate control. Uh, I've just been recently reading through a psalm a day and praying that psalm, and I'll have to say that, as uh, some teacher said, that basically the whole psalm, the whole Psalter is about not my will, but your will be done. And there's lots of ways to get at it. And it really helps your prayer life and keeps you focused and leads you to other parts of the Bible. So that's really one thing that I think that we need to find is stick with the Word of God. It's the thing that no matter what studies have been done and what groups that they have uh, 
investigated, the number one thing that most people say has to do with their spiritual health is the scriptures, reading it, mulling it over, meditating on it, memorizing it, uh, becoming familiar with it because it is food, it's nourishment, it's also knowledge. All right. Now we have two other things here about the purpose and the mission and then contact with the group. And I'm going to ask uh, Dan Lights to, to focus on uh, about the purpose and mission and the importance of that and, and getting involved with people who have a purpose and mission. Then I'm going to ask Cindy to talk a little bit about the power of community. So let's just do it that way. Then we'll close the program for today. So Dan. Yeah. So I've, you know, I've found, I think, I, well, I shouldn't say, I think, I hope most pastors go through what I went through when I became the lead pastor here. Obviously there are certain things that churches do. Uh, we worship, we pray, uh, we send people out on missions. There's, there's kind of the general prescription of what it looks like to be a church, but I wanted to get deeper. And as we've even talked about, sometimes that's a rabbit hole. You answer a question, you get to 12 more. Um, and so I question what, what is the church? What's its purpose? Obviously, it's to um, equip the saints for the work of ministry, but how do we do that? And as I've gone down this rabbit hole, I have come to that simple understanding, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, but it's the mandate of Scripture, Jesus' last words, to his people to go make disciples. And then he said, and just hang out here in Jerusalem for a little while, because in a short time, my spirit's going to come upon you to be able to fill you to do that work. And that to me is, it has given our church life, purpose, mission. It has set us apart for the work that he has called us to do. And if I'm going to be part of the bride of Christ for when he comes back, I want to be doing the thing he called me to do. Yeah, and it's the only thing he's authorized us to do. That's right. Amen. Uh, Cindy, about the power of community. So Jesus, when he came, uh, surrounded himself with a community as he stepped into his ministry. And he sent, he sent his people out two by two. He made this um, mandate for us to do things together. Community brings with it the ability for us to be held accountable the ability for us to grow with one another, to be with like-minded people, to engage in that space, to do life together, because in the midst of doing life together, life sometimes life's just bad. Sometimes it's just hard, and we have each other to do that with. We have, we have leaders that naturally come out of that space that God calls and equips to, to help us in that place. But community, because, because the Trinity exists in community, it's the, ultimate, um, it's the ultimate example of what we're supposed to do. And so when we follow Jesus' life, we see that he spent great time building the community and he sends us out into that place. Uh, I don't think we can make disciples effectively outside of community. Um, and I think that, that that covenant living, that understanding that we are about something bigger than ourselves. Um, the community helps us to keep that ever before our face so that we don't get in the place where we think we need to be God of our own lives. Well, that's how I think we bring order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. And that is these three practical steps, the word of God, the purpose and mission, and in community with others. All right, well, this has been a great program today. Uh, thank you. Cindy, thank you, uh, Dan. And remember, follow Jesus and he'll teach you everything you ever need to know. Well, we hope that the show wasn't too bad. Jane Hull wants everyone to know that if anything Bill said was offensive, <laughs> she feels your pain. If you were upset by anything Bill and his guests said, well, <laughs> mission accomplished. At The Bonhoeffer Show, we value irreverent, satirical, and generally inappropriate behavior. But when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission, we don't mess around. Remember, subscribe. We promise. No private jets, 
no white suits, and definitely no toupees.